As you know, the, in, in the artistry, and also as a student of ancient Indian artistry, I have noticed about the lotus motif in Ajanda and Lora and all this, many of the Indian monuments, and in Sanchi and you know many places. But uh, they were actually work of art. I seen as carved on the ceiling or wall or things like that. They are beautiful, but you don't think about it. Sasbahu temple is attached to a big lotus pond. And then I was sitting near that lotus pond and then got up and went to the Sasbahu temple. To my great surprise, the two large pillars and the top of it were beautiful lotus motifs carved. And then inside the temple, there were hundreds of other lotus motifs variations. Because I was sitting near a lotus pond, then when I looked at these carvings, then a very strange thing happened to me. I found, my God, these are artists who are looking, in, looking at these lotuses, studying them. And after studying them, they transferred them into stone inside the temple. So, first time I realized many of the great Indian art, you know, monuments, you see the artists interacting to the environment and from there taking imageries and creating wonderful things. So, a beginning of a new journey starts. I started sketching and studying Lotus Pond in different seasons, in different times. I went at night, I went on a full moon night. Then I went in a boat inside the Lotus Pond in Eklingji. And it was an experience of extraordinary experience. So, first time I realized in a Lotus Pond, Lotus flower which you see, ordinary see and understand. 
is something else and the actual lotus and its connotations are something else. So I could reinterpret lotus pond in my time, way I saw it in different seasons, different you know timings, different lights and then you know how they grow, how they die, how they dry up, then how they wither away. All these things became interesting to me. So it was a almost a lifetime's engagement. Everywhere in India, Buddhism, lotus is one of the most major, you know, symbols of life. So lotus, Ceylon, all the Buddhist temples they offer lotus flowers. And Buddha, of course, he born and he walked six steps. Each step, a lotus was blooming. You know that is the story. So lotus is a Extraordinary flower, if you ask me. No other flower in the world has this spiritual dimension in it. Because you know how much it has traveled. It has traveled and almost all the Hindu gods and goddesses, they sit inside a lotus. Lotus pedestal, peed, it has become one. Then in tantric images, lotus he say, like the, from the Kundalini to your brain, how it, you develop your, you know, tantric powers, it opens up petals after petals. Then when it reaches your brain, it becomes a fully blown, thousand petaled lotus. Now how these ideas came by looking at the flowers? And then attributing these qualities. How many flowers have that? That, you know, evoking a spiritual kind of quality. So lotus, I think it's one of the most remarkable image in the world art. A. Ramachandran writes in his Sketchbook of Childhood, The first milestone in the dawn of my memory is the clock. Its shape and sound rhymed with the first beat of my consciousness. This old clock was already there when I was born. When the first veil of mist dissolved in my mind, the dial of the clock appeared as a mystical yantra, a diagram of unknown power. Its fingers made victory signs every hour. The ticking of its shining pendulum was like the sound of the horse hoof in Dürer's etching, Death Carrying the Coffin. In my childhood, this ticking was indistinct and far, but today it sounds distinct and near. This clock must have watched me as a crawling infant. Painter, sculptor, graphic artist, designer and teacher, A. Ramachandran is among India's most distinguished artists. He is 
a bahurupi artist in its true sense. Ramachandran has ceaselessly experimented with visual language. In the course of a life devoted to constant learning, his vision and style have changed from somber expressionism to lyrical and metaphysical engagement with nature. In the process, he has explored diverse scales and media. His prose is as remarkable as his art. Ramachandran was born in Attingal, Kerala in 1935. Early in his life, he developed an interest in the arts, including painting, music and literature. He learnt Karnataka music for 10 years and established himself as a professional singer before he took to painting. <laughs> He also did an MA in Malayalam literature and came into close contact with the literary figures of the time, especially those associated with the progressive movement in Kerala. Attingal was a small principality once ruled by the Rani of Attingal. Among the cluster of temples scattered in the palace complex, the Krishnaswami temple with its indigenous Kerala architecture had a close personal association with the young Ramachandran. Ramachandran writes that in the Kerala temples, gods are remote, hiding within the dark precincts of the Garbhagriha. The darshan of the gods at the time of Arati was not only a memorable, but also a mysterious experience. When Ramachandran was four years old, his father joined the British Army during the Second World War and was captured by the Japanese in Malaya. The family lost all communication with him for eight years. However, during those years, Ramachandran never felt the absence of his father as his maternal grandfather enveloped him with a lot of love and care. When Ramachandran scribbled on the walls, he was the only one who would never reprimand him. To me, he has molded my mind because he has a lot of faith in me. He knew that I will do something different than other children. So he had an extra fondness. Of course, even in those days, I used to sing, sing well. So that was one of the things that if anybody comes, he will ask, call me and say, you sing a song in front of them. So I was a, like a, a performing artist even in those days. That's one thing. But then other thing is, I, I think, you know, he had a... I, I can't explain why he loved me so much. Because even as a child, when I'm sleeping at night, if he came late and if he is taking his dinner, he will wake me up and push a little um, food in my mouth. Then only he gets satisfaction. So he was very fond of me. So, because my father was in the world war, missing, you know, like I, when I was five years old, he went. And when I, he came back, I was around 12. So I did not know about my father that much. So my grandfather replaced and gave me all the love and affection I wanted. And it is surprising in a 
joint family with so many children he was little partial to me and uh, treated me very differently but the main important thing is that a sharing of a uh, of something very beautiful you know like he used to take me for long walks i have written about it so we will go to a a special place where it was a, on the top of a hill there is a palace maharaja's palace on the steps he we used to sit and watch the arabian sea the sun setting down so at the age of 6 or 7 you know he trained me to look at all these things must have been a great training for me to observe nature and uh, i think when he died i was in randani so i could not meet him see him but he molded me very much in my formative years ramachandran had not heard the name of ram kinkal until a few months before he joined kala bhavan in shantiniketan in 1957 he had the first glimpse of a sculpture by ram kinkal in an album of photographs while rehearsing rubindra shongit for the birth anniversary celebrations of tagore in trivandrum it was titled santal family ram kinkar's most remarkable and monumental outdoor sculpture when he saw it a shiver went through ramachandran's body as if he'd been struck by lightning for ramachandran going to meet ram kinkar at shantiniketan became a pilgrim's voyage rather than a way to obtain qualifications in art ramachandran remembers no one else has described the personality of ram kinkar as precisely as kg subramanian who called him khepa baul this bengali expression refers to the mystic cult of baul singers and their unconventional and detached way of life wandering from village to village society regards them as khepa or crazy when you are a young man there are certain things which are typical of that age so you know as an young man you may like certain things where that is you are bound to be ram kinkar was a glamorous romantic hero for us he was a genius he used to drink he is not married he behaves very eccentric way and he is a nuisance public nuisance all these things become very fascinating for me for young people like us than a conventional a conventional teacher like nandala nandala was a great teacher but we were not grown up enough to understand his greatness this i am not quoting is this sentence from i am quoting what ram kinkar told me in those days i used to be critical about nandalal's drawings and things comparing with his own drawings and things like that i say why that force is not there just as you do drawings they are so powerful why it is not powerful like yours he is your teacher so he says you are so stupid you will never understand these things and most probably he was correct i was stupid at that time. it took ramachandran many years to understand the greatness of nandalal bose or master mushai as he was known at shantiniketan as a student Ramachandran's impressionable mind was overwhelmed by Ram Kinkar's powerful works and flamboyant personality. Today, he regards Nandalal Bose as the greatest intellectual whose contribution to the philosophy of art, art education and visual culture has not been surpassed by any other Indian artist. According to Ramachandran, in the last 15 years of his life, Nandalal Bose became completely austere and worked tirelessly. 
Through his works, he became a sannyasi, one who has experienced all the turbulence of life. His brush strokes became minimal and the picture space served as the ground for the eternal Leela, addressed to nobody but God. Having traversed the boundaries of a professional artist, Nandalal's art became his prayer, each brush stroke counting the beads of a rosary. It takes time to understand greatness of people. Some of the greatness are direct. It is easy to comprehend, easy to appreciate, like Ram Kinger. He has got that romantic aura of an artist who drinks, who paints, who is eccentric, who, is, who makes marvelous, you know, monumental sculptures and powerful paintings. Here is another person who is like a monk, who paints very quietly in the corner of his studio. Small, small verse, which needs a lot of attention and meditation to understand. That is the difference. So that takes time. So only by growing up more mature in my art and thinking, I started liking Nandalal and actually I consider him even greater than Ram Kinkar. At Shantiniketan, the company of the now forgotten artist Kiran Sinha first taught Ramachandran how to deal with the Santal tribals during sketching. Sinha was a rebel who travelled widely before settling down in Shantiniketan. He was a refugee from East Bengal and his wife, known as Rani Di, was a German Jew from Vienna. Knowing Sinha was an extraordinary experience for Ramachandra. Of course I remember him, but in his case, you know, he, to a great extent, it is his own making also. He, he, he had a wife who was, was a German Jew. And she was quite eccentric, I must say. So because of her eccentricities, she is doubtful of anybody going there. She will always say a sentence, Chori karne aata hai log. So they think, but you know, yes, people will come and take away his work. He's so precious, so good. Yes, he was a good artist, but not, not that great as Ram Kinger or something like that. But he was fairly a very good artist. I am obliged to him because he used to take me to Sandal villages. Where he used to sketch, I used to sketch. So that way, how to behave in a Sandal village, how to handle the tribals. You know, small, small things he taught me. He never gave a packet of cigarettes to anybody. Then everybody wants one packet each. Give one cigarette when ten people are there. Ten people will smoke that same cigarette in turn. Because that is the way you have to... Because in a sense he taught me tribals are very simple and naive. But they also can be misguided. And once it is misguided, it will be difficult to control. So that some of the, many of his teachings turned out to be very correct. And then said never drink, in a, never take drinks in the, in the tribal villages. Because then people will be suspicious about your character. Which is true. Many of the artists from Trantanayan and everything, they go and drink there and finally get beaten up by the sandals because they don't know how to behave there. So the, you see, these are subtle lessons how to, you know, behave in a in a village where this other culture hasn't come. So we have to go down to that level. As I told, somebody says, "You do my portrait. I have to do. I have to do it to please them." And if they say I will colour it with my daughter, I have to keep quiet. I can't say don't do it, I am a great artist, don't spoil it. I can't say that. Because that is their culture, you know. 
So, so you know, this is a, a special training you need, how to handle tribals when you go and sketch them, study them. Within a year of arriving at Kalabhavan, Ramachandran had fallen in love with Chameli, daughter of a great Chinese scholar, Tan Yun Shan, who was also associated with Shantiniketan. He was the founder of China Bhavan, the oldest center of Chinese studies in South Asia. In those days, the tall, slim Chinese girl with a pretty face would haunt Ramachandran in his dreams. They married after 10 years of courtship. Chameli herself is a significant painter known for meditative moorings in her poetic works. Nature is her leitmotif. type. You know? So I was um, careful not to fall in love or anything, died <laughs> easily. But I really admired his work. I think I fell in love with his work before I loved him. So that is the, you know, I, when he, he used to show me, call me sometimes and show his work. and. I used to be very impressed. So gradually, gradually, things change. And my admiration never many reduced or any, it only increased when I lived with him and saw him working. How, how much involved he is in his, when he dedicated his, in his work, I think that is a very rare thing. I don't know, I don't want to make any statement as such, but I think his dedication is very rare. Yeah, well, I must say, I saw Chameli first time. She came to ask me, I joined. She was in the second year, I was in the first year. She got admission in second year simply because she had art in the school. So she got admission in second year. I, with my master's degree, I was in the first year. So she came to ask me, she was the editor of a wallpaper magazine. She wanted me to write an article or contribute something. That is how she came first. And uh, yes, it was a love at first sight. In 1993, Ramachandran curated a major exhibition of Raja Ravi Verma at the National Museum. In the accompanying catalogue, he wrote, Only an artist with a remarkable gift and talent could have survived in a period where the normal position of an artist was that of a craftsperson. The life and works of this great painter from Kerala are a phenomenon in the history of modern Indian art. The Virma was popular only in Kerala. But outside Kerala, Riverma was not much talked about simply because immediately after the Bengal school as well as the progressives, 
and Amrita circle, all these, you know, the groups, all the modernists attacked his work, say, they are very cheap imitation of European art. So that is the thing, they just dismissed. They, nobody thought about the, the, the period and the timing when a Riviera was born. The unfortunate thing about Indian uh, uh, connoisseurs and uh, you know, art students, they forget the time span in which an artist is born and how he operates in that time span. So today you look, look sit here and you know, in this present time and looking at Riverma and saying that he didn't do this, he didn't do that. That kind of people like Swaminathan was very critical. When he put up the exhibition, many artists wrote against the entire exhibition. They went to the ministry asking to, to actually close, not to do the exhibition, because Riverma, they thought, was not even an Indian painter. But then the problem starts. How do you look at the history? The history is not no man's property. It is a flow of time. And in that flow of time, so many things happen. Immediately after the end of many of the traditional schools, most of the patterns, like the little kings and uh, the chieftains of India, they themselves started imitating the European art and the European culture. That culture has produced the Riverma. But the difference is that Riverma is also a product of Indian culture. So he combined a period where the overemphasis of European culture is there. Still, there is a great element of Indianness which is which has gone into making a Riverma. So Riverma is something like Bengin Chandra Chatterjee. So today, to say Bengin Chandra Chatterjee is no of no consequence, he is saying that a novel form of writing called novel came into existence because of people like Bengin Chandra Chatterjee. So you cannot evaluate him with Prem Chandar uh, Sadhadasan Mandal. So that is the problem with history. We cannot move the time scale and evaluate people backwards. Each artist is produced at a time span and he is a creation of that particular period. So his merits and his defects should be understood from that point of view. Number one, today when you think of it, almost every Indian, even today, every Indian house, the puja room, there is a oleograph of Devyarma. How many Indian artists can say that, you know, my work has gone to each and every home in almost in a entire country. I remember when the exhibition was going on, a very old Sardarji came and told me, we, why don't you keep the exhibition open till 7 o'clock? It used to be closed by 5 o'clock. I said, why? He said, my sons and grandsons are all working here and there. I want all of them to come and see this exhibition. Because nobody has seen the original. And in fact, if you see an original Revi Verma, then you see the quality of his work. Don't evaluate him from the oleographs. He was, a, I don't think any Indian artist exceeded in European technique in many as much as what he accomplished as an oil painter. And also, at a very young age of 52, he died, passed away. And he made a huge body of words which are actually thematically covering the entire Indian epics, Mahabharata and Ramayana. And with the result, you know, he created an audience right from the poorest to the richest. Even today, I tell you, the biggest art collector who, who says, I want a Picasso, if you give a Riverma, you will buy first Riverma. That is the quality of it. So I don't think 
because somebody painted beautiful you cannot devalue it him devarma should be understood according to the historical perspective in 1964 ramachandran moved to delhi and joined jamia millia university he and his colleagues developed a full fledged faculty of art at the institution to be very frank with you shanti nikayan itself has deteriorated forget about uh, jamia or baroda they all in institutions once started bright with bright people and did so much of pioneering work they have all gone to in a, in a sense of neglect the modern art education is no longer the same as we had we had this uh, intimate relationship with the teacher i could go with the ramkinger for sketching go and sit in his house even at night talk to him about art and all the teachers they entertain students even there is no class at all they are ready to teach you or talk to you that was the idea of tagore tagore visualized shantini ketan as a place where the teachers and students all live together one of the best thing at santhaya and i have seen they used to take all the students to ajanda or elora put a tent everybody lived there they all cut vegetables cooked food themselves served it and then went to the caves for sketching and stayed there for 15 days 20 days these were all very memorable experience of teaching after all what can you teach you can teach teaching is not like you know some medical treatment you know you prepare some capsules and give to the students and they suddenly become artists they don't it is the question of understanding their capabilities all the students will not become artists and only the talented will become artists if the students are not talented even if you are because so you can't do anything so that is the fact about art education art education in one level is giving a sense of aesthetics to the children that level is fine to making of an artist is a different uh, game altogether an inspiring teacher to his numerous students He was simultaneously recognized as an important Indian artist through many significant exhibitions.
Kali Puja is uh, interesting to you people because Kali Puja ha was a very, very strong statement and very, very strong imagery because I watched that uh, animal sacrifice. You see, ultimately I have found that visual imageries which have to be powerful, you have to have a direct confrontation of things. Even when I paint this, it is the girls who my, I saw they are collecting flowers, their sketches and drawings and the impact their images making on me, helping me to do. I am not composing, I am not sitting at home, home and creating all these women and men in my canvas. They are all there. Each and everyone is there. I met them in some part of uh, the village or Rajasthan. I sketched them. So when I conceive a painting, I remember those faces. I remember their structure. I remember the costume. I reuse it. That is how I have a, what you call it, authenticity of a visual background when I draw. I am not just uh, making a cerebral exercise. Many of the Indian artists, they are composing. Na? They are composing figures in their own way. I am not. I am only re restructuring my memory of the images I have sketched. Of course, the moment I sketch, I am actually transforming them into pictorial possibilities because they can be used in different ways. So they are my raw material. The art practice of Ramachandran underwent vital changes from political expressionism to the mythical realism of Indian and Oriental art after he witnessed the anti-Sikh riots in Delhi in 1984. He says, I thought I will never do a political painting again. After all, a painting is a beautiful object. A painting of a dead Christ is also beautiful. No, no, it's in the same studio. The studio was not here at that time. It was only ground floor and this small room. I was standing somewhere there. The whole thing was open. There were not many houses. They were chasing one Sardar and Chasing like a dog and killing him. Somehow, you know, because I have not seen violence like this in Kerala. When you are children, we have not seen violence. We have not seen partitions. We have not seen people, you know, killing each other in that way, that cruel way. So, once I saw that, I used to, I started thinking about it, you know. That we all paint, you know, protesting against all these things. But a painting is a beautiful object. St I still believe, I have not changed my mind. After that incident, till today, I have not changed my mind. I follow the same principle. That I will not use my art to show the grotesqueness. Say for example, this corona. Hundreds of people died in Ganges, dead bodies were floating. People were walking miles and miles and dying on the way. Many people painted. I did. I painted lotus ponds. Because it is not, why should I paint and sell it for some, you know, thousands of rupees and, and then enjoy my life, it is criminal. A work of art is an object of beauty, basically. If people buy such words, it's only for status symbol. I don't think they enjoy it. And then if there are words like bacon or something, they are good in a museum. But no person would like to Leave it such a
his great work yayati 1984 to 86 ramachandran started an open engagement with the visual language of the eastern art traditions this also brought about a parallel shift in his work from the melancholic theme of human suffering to the beauty and splendor of nature a major character of mahabharat yayati fascinated ramachandran for many years for him he was a human being with normal human failings and foibles ramachandran created a temple for him and wanted to confer on him for all his weaknesses the distinctions of a hero sensuousness is the central theme of these panels ramachandran used the scheme of kerala murals which expresses the sensuousness of the body through the most unconventional selection of colors Frankly, I don't think about Ayadi anymore. It is like uh, asking about uh, a love affair you have done when at the age of twenty or twenty-one. Uh, today, even at the age of eighty-six, eighty-seven, I don't know how can I respond to such things. Ayadi was a period of evolution in my life. you know from the my when i entered in the art scene which is highly uh, influenced by european art and american art movements so i was uh, first i was taken into the trend i did some of the works which everybody appreciated but then i started questioning myself perhaps this many people don't understand why i questioned it not because i was unpopular i was more popular in those days than after doing ayadi i my basic question was that indian pictorial vocabulary is different from the european vocabulary so basically we have to create a language which we can be proud of our own so it is no use saying art is international no I personally think art is not international. Yes, you can read a Russian novel, appreciate Tol- Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, but you can't be a Russian. So there is a lot of difference between that. So to be an Indian, writing like a Dostoevsky is next to impossible. Same thing with artists. However, you imagine you cannot be a Picasso. Picasso is a product of a particular. culture however you want you can't be an andrew road only an american culture can produce that so my simple uh, you know submission is that each country has its own ethos it has its own cultural patterns and those cultural patterns should ultimately reflect in your work that is the criterion of you know judging whether he belongs to our own culture or he is thinking about somebody somewhere else someone else that is the crisis which i faced before ayadi even though i had all this influence of uh, you know mexican artists influence of uh, 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 this uh, british uh, art what is his name francis bacon bacon francis bacon so all these things were there i was also seeing as much as other artists were also seeing but then this this was a personal kind of a dilemma which i could not have shared with any artist so i went back and went back to my studies of kerala murals and strangely enough yeah these triggered by kerala murals than than ajandar uh, as people think Ajanda is only reference point. Basically, it is a Kerala Kerala mural tradition, and the study of it that made me think of a new visual language and a new visual 
uh, structure. To some extent, I succeeded, I won't say. I was completely successful. But it was a beginning. After that work, I got confidence that I can break through any conventions what people think. And I can do my work confidently. And with the result, I was rejected by the, uh, the artists of that time and art critics of that time. I, I can't help it. But it happened. And then it was difficult for me to explain to them that, look, I'm not doing something stupid as you people think. As much as you people talk about, you know, European art critics and, and their evaluation of art, I'm also thinking about my own art and my own culture. So against that background, I took a decision on to do something different. But at that point of time, it was wrong and it was suicidal. So around almost 10 years I was in the wilderness after so much of acceptance. So now I'm happy. Today, see, the, the art fair, I saw some of the shots. I discovered that the art has opened up so much. Everybody can do anything and call it art. It's a great freedom from my time to this. So, you know, today, tomorrow, there cannot be any limitation saying you can only do this and you can't do this. This whole notion of deciding what is good and what is bad in art is a wrong proposition and a wrong exercise done by few intellectuals of my time. Ramachandran's exceptional contribution to art history was the writing of a book on Kerala murals after intensive field work, compiling a survey of sites and photographing them with maps of each site. No one has done such extensive work till now. In the usage of colours, Kerala murals stand apart from other Indian art traditions. When I joined uh, Shantadigayadhan, there was too much of emphasis on the traditional Indian painting rather than the academic uh, techniques practiced by the European masters, which was prevalent in the other art schools. So that itself was a, a bit of surprise to me because Nandalal Bose did not allow any student to do more oil paintings, but he wanted the students to do I learned the technique of Indian masters, like uh, the fresco, uh, both Italian process as well as the agenda process. And then Tibetan tankas, and then Rajasthani miniature process, and Rajasthani arai process of fresco. So all this he emphasized that Indian technique is more suitable for the Indian you know, atmosphere, and uh, they will stay much longer than the European uh, techniques which we are practicing, especially watercolors. So, uh, when we were being taught the technique of agenda and also the fresco and other media, somehow by the copies which are displayed in Nandan of agenda. I had a vague memory of the same, similar thing I have seen in the Krishna Swami temple at my birthplace. So I wanted to verify that. So next time when I went to, uh, to my hometown, I went to this temple and checked it. To my great surprise, I found they are very similar to Ajanda paintings and things like that in tradition. Even though it is more archaic style, but the surface, the use of color and things like that add much more resemblance to Ajanda than any other paintings I have seen up that time. So, I... Uh, and, and also I went to Cochin and saw the Matanjari Palace and the curator was a friend of mine. So I took permission from him 
to copy the famous Kumar Sambhava drawings. They were only line drawings illustrating the marriage of Shiva and Parvati. They are one of the most beautiful drawings in Indian art. They are single line without any fluctuations. And then I copied them and I brought them and then went to uh, Nandalal Bose and showed him that trace. Nanda Babu being very interested in the Indian tradition, I remember his eyes brightened up by looking at those copies. And then he asked uh, questions about how do you know how it is being done and things like that. I said, no, I haven't studied it, but I will try to go back and do the studies of the technique used to by the Kerala mural artist. So that is the kind of an emotional beginning that I can go back and work on my tradition of my ancestors as a basis even for me as a professional artist. So unlike other artists of my period who went immediately after completing their diploma to go abroad and study in England or France. I applied for a scholarship for PhD because I had already an MA degree from Vishwabharati. And with that PhD scholarship, I travelled Kerala length and breadth, took photographs, copied many of the murals and brought them back to and that is how my research started. Ramachandran has written and illustrated numerous picture books for children, which have been highly acclaimed. Some of the original illustrations for these books are on permanent display at the Museum of Children's Books at Miyazaki, Japan. His wife Chameli also collaborated on these prestigious projects. Children's books are done in a very strange way because we, we with our two children were very small living in Jamia and during the summer vacation all my colleagues with their children used to go away to their hometowns in Lucknow or Aligarh or some other places. So in the house which we are living <coughs> there were Hardly anybody except myself and my children. It was quite a big house. And children used to feel very lonely. So I thought how to entertain them. So that is the time I started thinking about the stories which I heard from my grandmother and mother to tell them these stories. So just started by telling stories, I also got uh, I, I thought, why not, I also make a book like book form. And uh, some of the illustrations I did, uh, Mr. Arunpuri of uh, India Today saw. So he asked me to do six books for children. So that is my first venture into children's book. I wrote the stories. I did some of the drawings. Chameli did some of the paper cards. So it was a collaboration between myself and Chameli. That is how we started. And that first set of books published by Thomson Press, a Japanese publisher who came with a, along with an UNESCO team, saw my books and he was very impressed. So he sent me a ticket and asked me to go to Japan and make some books for them. But I made two books, Anuman and the Song of Circles. Anuman is based on you know, the famous uh, poem of Nambiar, Kunja Nambiar, Kalyana Saugandhiya. And uh, the other one was called the Song of Circles, which I made out of Tandrik Mandalas. So these were the two books I made. 
I took them along with me, and uh, once I reached Japan, they were so happy to see these books. They immediately bought the copyright and gave me quite a big money for that time. Then that relationship went on, and ultimately in Japan, I produced around ten books, and with the royalty money. In those days, when no painting was sold, I could make this house. Go out to nature and sketch was the first instruction Ramachandran got from his teacher Ram Kinkar. Sketching is at the core of his art, and it is difficult to count his vast output of sketches. He must have created more than one lakh drawings in his long career. Drawings I must have been doing as a child. All my notebooks, whether it is a textbook of Physics or biology, it's all full of drawings. Because I used to scribble. It. Scribbling is one of my bad habits or good habits, what you call it. So as a student, I spoiled all my notebooks and textbooks by scribbling, for which I used to be reprimanded. And then when I went to Shantideketa, it was a great joy for me when Kingarad asked me to go out and sketch. And that sketch has become a tapasya for me. Through the sketches, I understood the world around me. Through the sketches, I could perceive many things which normally we don't see. It is the the uh, it is an extraordinary experience when you draw an object or a, any anything you draw. The kind of response you get is very different than just looking at something or writing about something. Drawing something is actually you are making a shorthand form of what you are looking at. So there is a already a transformation of a language happening at that time. That means when you look at something, you are recreating it. Through a language of your own, that language is has to be so precise, so that within a short time, you should be able to capture the essential characteristics and spirit of the object you are looking at. Now, this is the fundamental thing. Now, in this process, you learn so many things which you normally don't do. People say artists should have imagination. But even for imagination, you have to feed something there. Na? So, if you want your imagination to grow, for that also you have to look, observe, make short-term imageries, and store it in your brain, so that it comes out as strong images when you work on painting or sculpture. So it's a very a, a process which. Cannot be explained to anybody. Because people think you know, just sitting and sketching is just nothing. You know, just uh, you know, like a like a hobby. It's not like a hobby. It is like preparing for an examination. It's a very tough process. 
by which you are you are building a faith response system within you and the nature and that response accumulated in your brain recreates so many kind of variations of images most probably i could paint so many things so many variations and images even of myself because i i have developed this sketching and through sketching i developed how to create more and more varied kind of forms based on the fundamental shape and structure After his intense love affair with Jameli, Ramachandran's second love affair was with Rajasthan. For Ramachandran, Rajasthan is a place of strong creative inspiration. And for him, Rajasthan means Udaipur and small places like Nagda, Beneshwar, Eklingji, Obeshwar and many others. He first traveled to Udaipur in the early 1970s. After that, whenever he went there, it was like a journey into the past. The people, their costumes, the architecture, landscape, miniatures, everything was inspiring. But exploring the tribal belt was more exciting for him and full of creative delights. In Shandhaniga, then we were taught to go out to Sandal villages and sketch and study. That was the basis of my art learning itself. So when I came to Delhi, 
it was i used to wonder how i will proceed without a you know raw material because i am not the artist who who will sit in a studio and uh, make images with a kind of a cerebral attitude no i wanted to work from life and i think that life will give a different strength to the work whatever you do so when you study from nature you get a different uh, kind of quality to the images you create than an image you sit in your studio and structure and compose it so that that is the kind of learning nandalal and ramkinger and all these people followed and i am a part of that system so in in delhi the first experiment i did that is in near jamia millia the villages ariana villages i used to go and sketch but somehow because the people are not familiar with the sketching of an you know the artist coming and sketching i could not feel that comfortable because people are not comfortable with me then the second major attempt i i did was when i came to this house nearby there was a big settlement of uh, gaudiya lords so i tried to go and study they were also not very uh, helpful because they are also very aggressive and the people i used to take my wife as a support because otherwise they may misunderstand if i drawn sketch those girls uh, yes i did liadi on the basis of those sketches but then i knew i need a place where i should regularly go and study and sketch so that was the time when suresh my friend from udaipur classmate he called me to go there as an examiner so i when i went there the moment early morning i reached udaipur i opened my eyes and i saw in the horizon the beautiful udaipur fort and a big moon on the top of it it was one of the magical scene even today i have not forgotten that time when i saw this i thought my god this is a place where i should come and then everything fitted into that path i am fond of miniature paintings wall paintings there are plenty of them i could go to antique shops sit and see the miniatures for hours together then they took me to villages people are very gentle very cooperative and then they allow the girls to sit for me and uh, they were very respectful to you so that is exactly what i wanted i found my own world after that i never looked back whenever i got a holiday whenever i got time i used to travel to udaipur and then in those days there was no car so i used to sit behind the suresh scooter or lalit scooter and we used to travel to the villages and settle down all day and make sketches so that is the beginning of a a life of a new artist new artist even in indian context because in those days i don't think any indian artist was going to some remote place and sketching and doing any work so i had never told many people but if i told people that it's maybe i have gone crazy or something like that but today i think i am very proud that i have taken a decision like this i must have done more than to the relax drawings and sketches and studies last few years and they are the basis of my work so it is like you know you you collect flowers from the nature then you make garland with it whatever shape you like but the flowers have to come from nature you can't make a flower they will be only paper flowers they won't have the quality of a pure flower so that is why i think as an artist i am very proud that i went to nature 
and started studying just like my teachers did. physical features of the Bheels and the environment in which they live had certain qualities of mystery unknown to urban people. Ramachandran visited these places not like a VIP but as a common man. Unfortunately, all these places are going through a kind of death. Now, it is also not easy for Ramachandran to travel to these remote and almost dying places. But his creative batteries are always recharging with the remembrance of things past. For him, life is painting and painting is life. There are some people in villages, not only in Bengal, even in other places. They are the, the village actors. Their job is to, because they go from house to house and beg money, you know, for living. I don't mind saying I am one of those Bevarubis. Because every day, say Monday, you appear as Hanuman, second day you go as Ravan, third day you go as Bhim, fourth day you go as Draupadi, and sixth day you go as Krishna, like that. Each day you take a dress, wear it and go from door to door and they give you some money and that is how they live. I thought it is quite suitable for me. I am a person who has a diverse interest in doing things. I do children's book, yes. I do sculpture, yes. I do drawings, hundreds of them, yes. I do oil paintings, yes. I do watercolors. Yes, I can do wall paintings, yes. So, you know, when I am capable of it, Monday I will come as a painter, Tuesday I will as a sculptor. If I have time, third, Wednesday I will come as a potter. It doesn't matter much. Because I have a talent, why should I be ashamed of it? So, I am a Nohrubi in Indian art. If others cannot do, I really feel sorry for them.
Thank you.